So the title of the message today is, Have a Message, Be a Message. Have a Message, Be a Message, or Be One. Have a Message and Be One. So we'll get into this. You can sing this with me. I need sound. I don't know if it's on already. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. I Supposed to be singing along. I hope you are. Just as I am, though tossed about with many conflicts, many doubts, fightings within and fears without a land of God. You know, that song is so essential. It's so essential because God loves to take us just as we are. He loves us enough not to leave us there. Some of us started out in a train wreck in our lives, whether family or inflicted by external forces could have been internal forces. But I love this song, Just As I Am. I think, I think it's so on because we're so impressed with ourselves. <laughs> I'd ask every, anybody, I'd ask you, raise your hand if you've ever been impressed with yourself. Well, all of us would go, uh-huh. You know, I've broke some records in my life in swimming and uh, other things. I broke some bones. I broke myself more than once. <laughs> Anyways, I think I've broken the record for how many times you can fall on the ice and live. I'm not sure yet. But the PT people are like, oh, it's you again. <laughs> I know them by name. Might not be good, right? But just as I am, if we, if we compare ourselves to Christ, we ain't much. But we're everything he hoped for. E even if we're in the midst of foolishness or even, even on our worst day, 
he's still going, come on. I have so much for you. I have so much more for you. And when you're living under your potential and your value that God has gifted you, because from the point of conception, you became an eternal being with extreme value and extreme potential. And the devil right now is telling you, no, you're not. Do you know why he's saying that? Because he hates the fact that you could potentially live with God eternally in the eternal state. He knows that you, you are a weapon that God is forming and God is shaping and God is sharpening and God is preparing to use for his glory. And the devil hates that, so he's going to just keep trying to beat you down. He's going to keep trying to tell you you're, you're a piece of rotted flesh and <laughs> don't make me get political. But let me tell you something. The devil is not going to stop telling you bad things about yourself. The devil is not going to stop magnifying the garbage that, that sometimes, you know, it's 87 or whatever it is percent um, or 89 percent. Who cares? But the point is, there's like 89 percent of the things that you worry about never come to pass. Yet I don't remember what the number is, but it's huge. Isn't that ridiculous? You know what that means? We focus on a lot of things we don't need to focus on. What we need to focus on is Christ. Amen? And I came across the, these images, and I'm just like, you know, I kind of like that. It's just black and white. It's just simple. And I'm thinking of the tree off to the right hand. Well, it's your right too, right? Yeah. The tree off to the right-hand side, man, does it have a lot of hair. It's impressive. It's got, it's styling. But the one on the left doesn't have much of nothing on it. Hmm. And the devil would look at us and say, you know, you're not much. You're just not much. But you know, the tree on the left, if it blooms the way it looks like it's going to later in the year, it's going to have a bazillion times more foliage on it. I don't know. But what I know is this, is I come just as I am. Whether I have hair, don't have hair. Whether I'm impressive or I'm unimpressive. Where I have, whether I have cool sneakers my son got me for Christmas. Or Father's Day. I think it was Father's Day. He's trying to get me to look better. <laughs> yeah i'm just like whatever but i like them and by the way they're comfy after i put a shoe stretcher in them they weren't comfy when i got them just as we are just as we are and so many times we try to clean up before we come up before we fess up and the lord's going why are you wasting your time you ever seen uh, somebody work on, uh, for those who are engine people, you ever seen somebody work on an engine who barely knows what they're doing and how arduous or how torturous it is to watch them painstakingly walk over to the book, get an instruction, I'm talking about the service manual, and then, you know, the big ones, the old big ones we had? And, and then they go over and they turn like two bolts, maybe one, and then they go back over to the book. Actually, the book was over here. They go back to the book. They read one more thing. They come back to the engine. They do one more thing. They go back to the book. And then a race car mechanic walks up. This happened to me years ago. I was rebuilding a Ford 300. Some of you know what that is. But it's a straight six-cylinder engine. I had pulled out of my van. And I'm, you know, anyway, we boarded out 20 over, shaved the heads, blah, blah, blah. We, it was a total rebuild. Well, I don't want to mess it up. I didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't want to hurt any parts. So I'm walking back and forth from the book, and I don't remember why I couldn't put the book closer, but I'm walking back and forth. And I, I mean, it was torturous, my, my friend said. He had walked in. I was uh, yard foreman at the wrecking yard only because I'd put the pieces where they belong and label them. Anyways, and he walks in, he was our mechanic, 
And he truly was a race car mechanic. And he finally just goes, I can't take it anymore. Bring it up to my shop. So I'm like, serious? I'm not even going to ask you. I'm telling you, bring it up to my shop. Okay. So moved everything up to his shop. He laid everything out on this bench. And then he proceeded to reassemble this thing. I think he had to um, hone the valves or whatever that is. Anyways, he had to do some stuff still. But he did it in seconds. He literally, if you've ever watched a race car mechanic working, he, re he put that whole thing back together. And I mean, and it ran the first time we shot it off. I'm like, well, it probably would have happened if I got it done. He would have, I would have had to go, hey, what did I do wrong? Anyways, I was in awe. Seriously. I was just like, wow. Because I've rebuilt some engines before, but this guy was, I mean, he just laid it out. And then it went, whoop, all back together. And he goes, there you go. I couldn't stand it. And he said that. It was so funny. But I mean, some of you ladies, you know, um, I, I don't know, my sister Annetta, um, who passed, um, she was a mechanic, she was mechanical, my, my family's mechanically inclined. Anyways, we have a high aptitude for that. But some of you others, there's other things that you're good at, whatever it might be. You know, um, so for instance, if you're one of those people that type and you're on the keyboard and you're hunting and pecking, it doesn't really drive me crazy. I'm just like, if you'll give me that, I can get that done in three seconds, right? And then I had a guy that worked for me at Newport Fred Meyer that was one of the fastest in the world. He actually was in competition for keyboarding for how fast he could type. And so I had these huge reports I had to do, I think it was once a quarter, something like that. And um, I would take them to him and I'd go, I'll do something, even though I didn't have to do it this way, but I'd tell him, I'll do something for you if you'll do this for me. Because it was pages and pages and pages and pages of reports. And I had to consolidate and, and put it all together and then shoot it to the main office. Well, anyways, I'd hand it to him and he would go, um, let's see, he would, he would look at the page, he'd never check the screen, and he'd just go, zzz, zzz. And I'd be out doing something for him, and a couple minutes later, he's done with pages and pages of reports, inputting. All I'm trying to say is there's a difference between somebody who knows what they're doing and don't. And the Lord knows what he's doing, and we don't. I have been privileged in my life to sit under some amazing people in teaching, training, and coaching in my life. And I am, I just, I'm so grateful for that. But I can say this, I'm glad that the Lord takes me as I am. I'm glad the Lord has taken you as you am. It's good English. Because we're the one that he loves. And his love never fails. Because it never fails. So I want to take a historic zoom back in the time. And we're going to start from Ur of the Chaldees with a guy named Abram. And this guy named Abram was just as he was, according to, I think it's the book of Hebrews. But it, according to the scripture, it says that Abram and his dad, Terah, and his uh, brother, what is it, Nahor or Something like that. Anyways, but his family and his half-sister, Sarai, they lived in Ur of the Chaldees. And the Lord knocked on his, his life and said, hey, follow me. Leave everything you know and follow me. And as he began to follow and as he began to grow, as it, at a measly 100 years old, God renamed him Abraham because he had a message 
He went from somebody who couldn't have children to somebody who could. And some of us are people who couldn't have spiritual children that can have spiritual children. And our name changes, not to just what it is, but also adding Christian, reflection of Christ. Isaac and Jacob, Jacob's name uh, changed to Israel, which means uh, prince of God, because he had work to do, and he's the one that God used to grow him up. Oh, and I wanted to, I wanted to just mention this. The question came up recently, why do we love Israel? Why do so many Christians love Israel? That's because it's Israel, the, the Israeli people are the ones who owned, the ones who received the law and the prophets, the ones who received the greatest, great and precious promises of God. They're the ones that the Messiah was birthed through. They're the ones that God has said, if you will bless them, I will bless you. If you will, if you go against them, I'll be against you. But in it, and then the promise that God said to Abraham, He said, "In your descendants, in in your descendants, the world will be blessed." Anyways, so there's a there's a lot of us have a heart for Israel, and we pray for them. We pray for the peace of Israel, um, as well as for all y'all. And we, we, get, we come in every day and we pray. A lot of, we have the chairs are usually set in a circle right in here. And you're welcome to come. We officially start at 9 o'clock. Uh, but you can come anytime. If uh, Sometimes before 9 o'clock, you might catch us that early. Uh, and sometimes we are. But if you come in at 9.30, you're, we're still going to be here. So it's not about what time you get here. It's not how long you can be here. I know when I was in business, a lot of the things like this, I was able to go in and be there for a few minutes, and then I have to go. And we would love to have you come and be a part of our prayer team because it makes a difference. Amen? So I just wanted to mention that a little bit about Israel. Sometimes the, the question comes up. You might not know this, but the... Um, the top of the Dead Sea, the water um, of the Dead Sea, is the lowest point on planet Earth as far as what you can touch. Now, obviously, under the ocean, there's some deeper places, but most of us can't quite swim that deep. But as far as, and, and this is my thoughts on that is that God said, this is where, and the scripture actually calls, uh, Israel, the center of the world. He literally says that. And it's the lowest point on the face of the earth, like God took his finger and went, here's where I'm going to make my stand. And throughout history, this is where he does make a stand. And he's making a stand to this day. And we're grateful for his help. That's for sure. One of the things to know about Israel, just as Christians, there are some that are sheep and some that are goats, some that are true followers of God and some that are fake followers of God. The goats are fake followers. The sheep are the real followers. So the Lord says, follow me, follow me. And, and the only reason I mention that is that sometimes people say, you know, if you study Israel, you'll find out that they're very secular. You'll find out that they follow a lot of false gods. You'll find out that they have just the same issues as a lot of America does. But you'll also find the people of God in amongst them. And I was pretty encouraged when uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, it's actually Benjamin. Anyways, but when uh, recently I found a video where he is uh, singing with a, a group um, of rabbis and stuff. He's singing the songs of God over Israel, the blessing of God over Israel. And I thought, ah, oh, that's good. Because if it's sincere as the leader of Israel, then God will move because he's willing to be seen. And by the way, you might say, well, of course, it's a Jewish land. Wouldn't that be nice? That's like calling America Christian. 
Wouldn't that be nice? The reality is, is that he went against the grain of, there's a lot of people in his land. They, they don't follow the Jewish faith, even though it is a place where it centers from. They don't follow it, but he, st he stood and let himself be counted as one that was willing to acknowledge the Lord. And I pray that it's with his whole heart, because that will make a difference for the country. Absolutely. And why are they getting uh, berated for defending themselves? It's simply because they're Jews. If, if it was Christians against the same kind of an attack, we get berated just because we're a follower of Christ. It's a guarantee. So that's my two cents on that. So that today we're talking about having a message and be one. What an interesting title. What it, and, and out of that, let's get into the, some scripture here. And it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and 2, it starts out with preach the word. Now, this is to all of us, but he is talking to his young pastor uh, prodigy. Paul is, the Lord is through Paul. Preach the word. Do you know what the difference of preaching and teaching is? In preaching, the word should be a sword, a hammer, and a fire. In teaching, you're disseminating information. I love to teach the Word of God, but preaching the Word of God is a different ball game. It's supposed to pierce your soul. It is supposed to lop the head off the enemy's influence in your life. It is to smash what is unusable for God, and it is to cause a fire to get lit under your lazy boy attachment disorder area. So we're to preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. And that means when it's a good time or when it's a bad time. You know, we have Easter coming up. That's in season. Did you know that? Do you know some people go, oh, we shouldn't, we shouldn't honor Easter and we shouldn't honor Christmas. And eh, whether they started out correctly, whether they, they have a, the right background, wrong background. I mean, I've done the studies. I've been through that, those college courses Yada, yada, yada. And let me tell you something. I love any opportunity I have that the world gives me to talk about Jesus openly and his resurrection openly, his death and, and abuse openly. That's what Easter does for us. And Christmas helps us to be able to communicate Christ mass, Christ gathering. It's so good. And whether it was picked on the exact right days who cares? Because it gives us an opportunity to preach the word in season and out of season. So I'm just telling you, let, it, let yourself get over it. Okay? I have some good friends, man. They just get these big knots in their shoulders and they start getting crazy. And they're just like, oh, we can't do that. And I'm like, why? I was in... What, you know, I worked in retail for 21 years, and the one thing I know is this, is they screw everything up and make it all about sales. I loved holidays before I got into retail. And then I loathed holidays. When you have Christmas on the same aisle as uh, uh, Halloween, makes you go... You know, that's something that never would have been done in this country years ago. But it is an absolute picture of how this country is living. We're going to have our Satan and our, and our Santa. Anyways. So be ready in season and out. Rebu reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. If you want to know what rebuke and exhort are, ask me later. And it goes on to say, for the time will come, we're here, guys. The time will come when they not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. Oh, I only hear what I want to hear. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside to myths. How do we stay on the right road? We stick to the word of God. We can, we can deliver it differently. You know how I know that? Because I've done clowning. 
seriously. I know I'm usually a clown, but I've done clowning. I've also, I, I've done a lot of puppeteering. One of my favorite puppets is, is um, oh wow, what is his name? Anyways, he's a crazy clown, or puppet, and he goes, hey, what's up? What are you doing? You see, you can get the word of God across in a lot of different ways. One of my friends that I worked with for years that I wanted to kick his tail for a few years. His wife worked for me at one of the Fred Meyer stores, and she sometimes would be crying at work. And it was usually before the, the store had opened. And she'd be crying. I'd, I'd walk over and I'd go, are you okay? What's up? Oh, and she'd tell me about the woes of their marriage and things he was doing, the way he was acting. And I happened to know that he was a bucket head because I shared an office with him. But one day we were doing uh, clowning and puppeteering at a Walmart parking lot in Newport, Oregon. And we were doing this outreach and it was crazy. But his wife had wrote one of the skits. So he came to see the skit she had wrote. And there I am, I'm on the goose clown. I got a white face, I look like a hobo. That's the way you dress up. And you know, probably why it worked is because I couldn't say a word. I was the type of clown that could just motion and fall all over the place. Maybe that's where I got, no. But long story short, he came to our clown act. He came to watch our puppets. He came to watch what the skit that his wife wrote, and he came to the Lord. And I mean, this guy was one you're like, there ain't no way. He was filthy-mouthed. Uh, wasn't the worst guy on earth. He just wasn't somebody you would think would ever come to the Lord. But the skit she wrote pierced his heart for God. And that was the message. And we got to do ministry together. That was so cool. But he says this, but you, be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. In other words, Paul's going, I, am, I see it. I see it, that no matter what I'm doing, is, is that I'm really just, I'm being poured out on the ground. You know, it's having some effect, but a lot of it is I'm being poured out on the ground. But you know what? When... When your children, when you have children, if you're a good parent, when you have children and your children are acting up, you feel like you've been poured out on the ground. They're just like, who cares what you've done for me? Poured out on the ground. And he says, but, and it goes on. I mean, he just says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. You see, whether you're being poured out on the ground or not, it's, it's the one or the two or the however many that come to Christ in the process that matters. So I would say that my friend, Sue, that she felt like she was just kept being poured out on the ground. And, and I know from conversations with her, she just kept feeling poured out on the ground by her husband because he was such a knucklehead. I'm so glad he loves Jesus now and that he's my brother. But she, he just kept pouring her out on the ground by the way, he, uh, at, the way he talked, the way he interacted with her, the way he treated her. But she just kept going and she wanted to stop. She had the right to throw him into the fire several times in their marriage. And she held it out. It was 30 years 30 years. And then it was through something God wrote, had heard right as a, um, I, want, I don't remember if it was a clown skit or a puppet skit. All I remember is, is that it was something that God had her right. He came to watch it and he got saved by it. Amen? Is that not cool? 
God wants to use us. God wants us to have a message. And he wants us to be one. David had a message. David was called on by God to do things that were way beyond his ability. And the message I think that David conveyed the best was this. The battle belongs to the Lord. David was always asking, Lord, how would you have me to fight this battle? When he would go up in a battle, sometimes against the exact same group of people, and he would still say, Lord, how do you want me to fight it this time? And the Lord would tell him, well, don't, and, and David, one of them, he goes, you, you want me to do it just like last time, right? Nope. This time I want you to set an ambush, and I want you to do this, I want you to do that, and then I basically want you to watch. And so they did. And they routed their enemies, and then they got to participate in the, um, the uh, cutting of the hair and anything else that moved. John. Oh, David's message is the battle is the Lord, and he was won by being a mighty warrior. You see, ba David never hesitated to go into battle other than the momentary hesitation of, God, how do you want me to fight this battle? He was a warrior for the Lord. Amen? What's John's message? Make straight the, way, the path of the way of the Lord. Make straight in your heart the way for the Lord to come. Make it straight. And what was John, how did John live the message out as being the one? He spoke boldly while he was threatened ongoingly. And remember, John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet. John the Baptist was part of the priestly line. You may not know that, but he was part of the priestly line. He could have lived nicely in those days. He could have lived very well in that day just being one of the priestly kids. He could have had it easier. He could have had people bowing to him and people saying, oh, rabbi, tell me this, and oh, rabbi, tell me that. But instead of that, he went out and did what God told him to do to help make straight the way of the Lord in people's lives. And, and how he was one is he spoke boldly exactly what he needed to say. And I, one of my favorites, when he goes, you brood of vipers, who told you to repent? <laughs> do you know that doesn't get you fanfare when you tell people they're a brood of vipers? <laughs> they get a little nervous about you. And then Herod, he was so bold that he even tells King Herod, who was a puppet king, yes, so he's basically a, a sub-governor, but anyways, but he, could, he had the right to kill him if he wanted to, and he said, it is inappropriate for you to have Herodias, the wife of your brother, as your wife. It is not appropriate. You see, he didn't change his message for nobody. And that's why he was able to be who God needed him to be. And he did it so well, he got his neck stretched over it. Actually, they didn't stretch it. They just trimmed it. Cut it off with a sword. Just for doing his job. Hmm. Because he was one. He was the message. Jesus Christ, his primary message is the kingdom of God is near or the kingdom of God is at hand. And I love it. And I, I just tagged on his, you know, uh, how did he live it out is he didn't want heaven without us. So he brought heaven down. So he had a message, but he was the message. Well, of course, everything's about him. We know that the whole script, all of scriptures is all about him. In its fullness. But because he didn't. He and his father did not want heaven without us. Because you know you were created to be God's inheritance. And one of the problems we have in our lives is we think. Well I don't know if I want to follow God. I don't know if I want to hang out with him. I don't know if I want to spend time with him. I don't know if I want to believe him. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's why the Lord takes you just as you are. 
Because the devil has taught you to say, I don't know. The devil has taught you to say, well, I don't know. Because I'm really pretty sure I want to have it my way. That doesn't get you where you want to go. It gets you where you think you want to go. And later on, you'll regret it. So what is the message God has given you? What is the message that God has given you to be? What is the message God needs you to be? You know, the message that God may need you to be might be quite different than the message of what God needs me to be. Because I've been called into ministry. I've been called as one of the five equippers, which is apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. Anyways, so I've been called into that equipping ministry to equip the saints for the work of service. Oh, there it is. Don't forget. My job is to equip you to go do what God wants done. Because I'm a saint, I also get to do it. But my job is to equip you to do what God wants done. Your job is not to watch me and warm the pews. Your job is to get out there and do. In fact, when I was in... Um, Throughout my life, I've gotten to be in management positions, and I'll never forget after the second or third one, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, why? Why do I keep getting in management positions? I don't care if I'm in charge, and that is who I am. I don't care if I'm in charge. I said, why? And he says, because I'm training you to be a leader. And I went, oh, okay. I'm okay with that if that's what you want me to be. So I was, I've been a trainer all my life. What is the message God needs you to be? In Ezekiel chapter 12, Ezekiel is called on by God. And if you really want to have a cool ministry, try to emulate Ezekiel. And when you read Ezekiel, you go, mm, not so much. There's some things God had Ezekiel do that are not exactly comfortable but it, the Lord tells him, I will set you as a sign. In other words, I'm going to make your life a sign for the Israelites. And for instance, one of the things he had him to do one time was he had him to gather all of his luggage together and then literally dig a hole through the city wall. Literally dig a hole through the city wall and escape through the hole. And it wasn't war yet. But it was coming as a message to the people of his day in the, where he was at. That, by the way, captivity is coming for you. And so God used him as a sign. He, used, he had a message that he was preaching, he was teaching. But he, God used him as a sign, as the message. Genesis 6, we see that God calls Noah... To build an ark. And his message is. Repent. Or you're all going to drown and die. And of course they laugh their heads off. Because they're like there is no way. That could possibly happen. And you're the dipstick that's building. What is that thing? It's an ark. What's it for? Well there's going to be a flood. What flood? Well it's the world's going to flood. And all those who. Well in basic repentance all those who will follow god they can get on board and they can be saved that's basically and the scripture says he preached for 100 years and he couldn't get anybody on the ark other than a bunch of animals because the lord sent him and then his wife and three boys and their wives it doesn't say that the kids qualified by the way but they qualified by Noah's righteousness. And we know that two of the boys did a pretty good job. Ham, not so much. But he preached for a hundred years. How long is God telling you to minister to your family and your friends? And you're not seeing fruit. And I'll be honest, I know what it's like to give up. When I was, when I, was I think, 19 at the time. 
I was 17 when I rededicated my heart to the Lord and I started praying for my family, my sisters and so on. I kept praying and I was fasting for them and I was fat praying and fasting for my mom and on and on. And nobody was changing. I might have actually still been 17 or 18. When I, when I made this statement to the Lord one day, I was just frustrated because they weren't having what I was having and they didn't want it. I just said, well, that's it, God. I'm sick of it. I've done everything I can. I'm t- Even if it was two years, isn't that nothing? But I was like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done trying to bring them to you. They're not going to come. Just do what you're going to do with them. And as clear as day, I'm not saying it was audible, but as clear as day, the Lord said, thank you. I'll take it from here. And in my naivety, <laughs> I'm like, cool, good. You know what started happening, like, immediately? My mom comes to the Lord, and then my sisters start coming to the Lord. And then my great-grandmother, who was 80, 81, she comes to the Lord. After, now, I didn't stop being a Christian. I didn't stop uh, sharing what God was doing in my life, but I stopped Maybe being forceful. I don't know what it was. (laughs) All of a sudden, they're all coming to Christ. Maybe the Lord needed me to back off so they go, hey, wait a minute. Don't we still get an opportunity? God is the one that's brilliant. We're not. Hate to tell you that. You might be offended. You'll get over it, especially when you get to heaven, right? Here's another one. Matthew, oh, this makes it so much easier. In Matthew 3, 2, and in Matthew 4, 17, we, and there were so many other times, the simple message that Jesus told us to have was the kingdom of God is near or the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay? And we complicate it. We make it sound like, and this is, I mean, I struggled with it when I was younger in the faith, is I thought I needed to know everything in the book before I could go share it. Do you know that the number one thing for you to share out there is your witness of what God did for you, your testimony? Do you know that your testimony is the most powerful weapon you have in your arsenal until you learn more of the word? But it still is. Because a person with knowledge, somebody might say, well, that's good for you. But a person with an experience, go ahead. Try to get me to throw off my faith. But I have experiences with God. And that I'm very grateful for. Amen? Now, why do you see something here in Revelation 3? We've talked about it. I think we just went over it like a week or so ago. It's just this. In Revelation chapter 11... And it starts out in verse 3. Also, I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, dressed in sackcloth. And if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and and consumes their enemies. Yes, if anyone tries to harm them, that is how they must die. Woo! Talk about fiery preachers. You see, these two show up, it's, you know, could be Enoch and Elijah, because they haven't died yet. But whoever it is that these two witnesses are, that God sends, whoever the, these two are, they, they, we are, if we understand it correctly, we, the church is taken out of the way, these two show up, and they facilitate the rebuilding of the temple, and they, they, they are God's witness in the world when we're taken, when the church is taken out. But the point is, is that They have a specific message. The kingdom of God is at hand, turn or burn. And how they know, how people knew whether it was turn or burn is when they tried to attack them, they got burned. Literally, fire came out of their mouth. Some go, oh no, that's just how they talk. No, it's not. It's literal fire. If you want to know, test it. If you're still here, you don't want to be. But these guys had a message that the people needed to repent and be saved. 
and they were the message. They lived it out. That's what God is asking us to do. So what is the message that God has given you? What is the message that God has placed upon your heart? And if you're taking notes, now would be the time to just jot down. It could be a single word. It can be several words. Or if you don't have something with you, then try to remember it by association of the Lord saying, this is the message I have for you. We know the base message is simply this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Either grab it or wish you had. Right? It is that simple. Oh, and by the way, there's people who will hate it. <laughs> Get over it. You know, since we're a target anyways, well, let's be a target worthy of our death. Serious. If we're going to get... If we're going to be attacked by the enemy anyways, then let's at least earn what we get. You might say, well, that's kind of martyr mentality. No, we don't choose to be a martyr. If God needs us to be a martyr, that's his choice. Because he has a choice to spend us any way he wants. And you might say, well, pastor, you're not being very encouraging to get me to want to come come to Christ and follow him because you're making it clear that if I do, I'm going to get attacked, I'm going to get abused, and I'm going to get misused. Well, welcome to humanity. But the difference is, if you come to Christ and you'll follow him, what you'll find out is, is you have somebody that's with you, somebody will give you power, and somebody that can even, quite frankly, make you unable to be caught or able to be seen, as he's done even with our soldiers. Do you know God still use hornets? I love that. You know he's still doing that in Israel? Woohoo! Look it up. It's pretty cool. What message has God given you to speak? My friend has been given by the Lord to be an evangelist. To be saying that the kingdom of heaven is his hand. Repent and be saved. You, know, you may not be called into the five equipping ministries, which is apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, which, by the way, are still all true ministries today. Apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. They are equippers of the saints for the work of service. But those are offices. So how are you going to be that message? What creative ways has God gifted you? And you may say to yourself, well, I've got to get rid of some stuff so that God can use me. I have a good friend that has been a biker. I, I don't know if it's all his life, but most all of his life. Um, his bike is way cooler looking than mine. And um, his Harley. And when I, w I had him in a training class that I was doing. And he said to me one day when we were kind of alone, I think only his wife was there. He said, Pastor Norm. I feel like I need to get rid of my motorcycle and all of my um, biker stuff. I, in, you know, in order to follow God with all my heart. And I said, did God tell you that? Well, I just, I, I just think I need to, you know, uh, he didn't say he wanted to be as bald as me. But anyways, and I, I looked at him and I said, you know, you better be sure that's God. Because I personally have a biker friend that I would not want to have met him in a dark alley. <laughs> he very much looks the whole part. And he's not small. But he loves the Lord with all of his heart. Even the hell's angels let him hang out. Because he doesn't attack them. He's leading them and he's led a few to Christ. And of course they come on out. And so I said to him, I said, you don't change a thing unless God tells you to change that. But I will tell you this so that I've learned in my life. If you're around a group of people that are cussing all the time and doing things that you ought not to be doing, you need to limit your exposure so that you're not influenced by them. Oh. I even have a... a well. A person in my life that is distant family, one day I had to tell that person because of 
in those days, they were being caustic. And I had to tell them, because they wouldn't quit attacking, actually, other people in the family. And I'm like, nope, not going to tell you anything. Anyways, and um, finally, I had to come down to and say, listen, number one, you keep doing this. I will hang up the phone. I will never call you back. Because I trust God. I didn't say that, but that's why I would do it. And they kept pressing. And I said, I, you need to understand, I limit my exposure to you because I don't want to be like you. You make me caustic. And they were quiet. It was two years until we talked again. That was an investment that was worth doing. I found out from the person's husband that it changed the dynamics of how she treated people at work, how she treated him, and how she treated the kids. She didn't realize she was that bad. And she wasn't a horrible person at all. She was just very type A. And I can deal with type A, but <laughs> you got to tell them. Knock it off. Anyways, what is the message God has given to you? What creative ways has God gifted you to be able to influence other people? I have a friend who sings, does outreach, crusades. They're very much a patriot. They do daily devotions and radio and podcasts, and, and they help lead a church. And those are gifts, as they would say, filthy rags, that God has given them. And it's... And the filthy rags are, one, one, once you do something good for God, it's a filthy rag because you can't live on that the rest of your life. you got to keep going. You know, think about it. A soldier in the military who guards one time and keeps somebody out one time from getting where they shouldn't be. And then for the rest of the time of their service, let's say they had 10, 10 years of service, for the rest of the time, they always slept when they were on guard duty because one time they did what they were made for. No. Let's not be that person that relaxes because one time we did something big for God. And honestly, compared to what God does, is it really that big? Is it? One of my favorite songs is that Jesus is the only name to remember. The only name under heaven by which men may be saved, but the name of Jesus Christ. By the way, your name will never be the name by which people will be saved. Years ago, they wanted to put my name on the sign, which is, hey, the sign guy actually called me back. We may get one someday. But the point is, is they wanted to put my name on the sign, and I said, no, thank you. Well, we want, I mean, I'm just not interested. And somebody might say, well, why? Well, they did say why. And I said, because it's not my church. It belongs to God. It doesn't belong to me. We all belong to the Lord, don't we? We are his. In fact, did you know this? This campus is owned by God, not by people. Do you know legally this campus is not owned by this church? Just might be something you don't know. We may pay the mortgage, but it's owned by God. Legally belongs to him, not people. God has given us a message. We need to be it. By his creative power to blow the enemy away more and more every day. And here's how we get qualifications to be used to have that message and to be that message. We all know this. We need to admit we're a sinner. We need to repent of our sins, turn our back on that. We need to believe in Jesus and his resurrection and confess it with our mouth and call upon his name. Let's go through this together. There is none righteous, not even one. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Can I just say at Celebrate Recovery last night, it was so refreshing to be in that men's group because it was so honest. Do you know that men struggle with men things? And girls struggle with girl things. That's why we separate them for the small groups. So they can go talk about girl stuff. And us guys won't be there to listen. And the guys go talk about guy things that the girls would go, you guys are sick. That's what we'd say about you girls, right? <laughs> you're sick. I had a lot of sisters, so I know you're crazy. Therefore, repent and return. That was so good. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he wants us to have that gift. Let's say this one together, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that a blessing? Because God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. In other words, it, confessing, saying he is my Lord in public around others, not trying to hide it. That Jesus is your Lord and believe it in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Why is it important that we're willing to confess the Lord with our mouth in public? Jesus said this, if you won't confess me before man, I will not confess you before my Father or his holy angels. So imperative. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in thinking and acting and reacting like God, righteousness. And with the mouth we confess, resulting in being saved from the destruction we're headed for. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When you call 911, who do you expect? The police? Is it only just the police? Yeah, it's a service, right? And they connect us to what we need, at least in hopes. In general, the moment you call 911, the police are dispatched. And they're usually there first because they get to drive like I want to. It's just not fair. But whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When you call on the name of the Lord, when you truly call out, Lord Jesus, or just Jesus, I need your help. Who do you think God's going to allow to respond to you? When you come to Jesus for your help, when you are sincerely asking him for help, do you think he's going to let Satan get in between it? No. But you better stay in faith. And you have to believe that you're going to receive because you called. Because if you don't, he says, you won't receive a thing. You'll be um, double-minded, unstable in all that you do. So many people that are diagnosed to being double-minded is just that. They're just double-minded. They say, I want to follow God, but, it, but then they, they follow the world, and they want the benefits of following God, but they want to follow the world. And some would say that that is a different thing. And not all, but many of them, it's nothing to do with the chemicals of the brain. It's all to do with the attitude of the heart. Staying centered with God. Call upon his name. Believe he's going to respond to you. And you will be saved from the destruction you're headed for. So the question is, have you received that salvation? And I still have Mary and Joseph on there. And the reason why is, is that it's easy for people to forget. Everybody has to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Not just us. Jesus desires your company. He wants you to come to him. And today is your day of salvation, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to have the fullness of all that he has, has created you to have. 
So what is the message he has for you? He wants you to have a message. He wants you to be a message. So I put the song back in. I don't know if we need audio. I put the song back in because this is how he takes you. This is how he took me. This is the way he takes me every day. Just as I am. And this is the way he wants to wants to receive you. Is just as you are. God is not impressed with our ability to be religious. God is not impressed when when we can quote 10,000 verses in a certain order, in a certain way, with a certain eloquence, or certain high religious words, religiosity. It's okay if you have that, if you know some of that. But God is never impressed with just how important, how impressive man-wise we can get. God just wants you to. God just wants you to come as you are. Please don't waste your time trying to become something so that you can come to God. Because what you'll try to become is not what He's looking for. He just wants you to be His kid. He just wants you to abide with Him. He just wants you to hang out with Him. He just wants you to walk with Him all the days of your life. Amen. Let's sing this one time. Can you stand with me? You guys need to wake up. It's warm in here. Just as I am, so tossed about with many a conflict, many doubts, fighting with it and fear. So while that's just playing, I'm just going to ask you. I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes and bow your head. I know we do this pretty well every week. But why take a chance of going out the way we came in? Why take the chance of not leaving with a message and becoming one? Why take a chance of still trying to do it on your own? Why waste your time? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that as we're here right now, Lord, we've been listening to your word. We've been listening to the way that you love your people. We've been hanging out with you. And, God, we pray that you would do a work that nobody else can. Right now, we need to hear from you. We need to hear you say, follow me. Follow me. God, I thank you for that. I thank you for the chance, choice, honor, privilege that we get to follow you. What a joy. What a privilege. What an honor. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'll ask again. If today you would say, I want to follow Jesus with all of my heart. And if this is your first time, would you raise your hand to the Lord? Nobody else should. Just as I am and Maybe that's you and it's not your first time. But you want to go further with Jesus than ever before. I raise my hand to that one. The Lord wants us to go further with him than ever before. So let's pray this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I want to follow you with all of my heart. I want to trust you more than ever before. I want you to give me a message. And I want you to help me to be the message. To be a sign to others of what they need before it's too Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. God, I pray over your kids this morning that, Lord, that you would bless them and keep them. 
make your face shine upon them and give them peace. I pray that, Lord God, that you would cause them to be more effective in everything they say and they do. That, Lord, that you would give them wisdom uh, to have an income, to make an income. God, I pray you'd give them so much. They have to hire people to help them to handle what you give them. And, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the way that you treat us. Thank you that you're always here for us. And you want to do more than ever before. In Jesus' name. Amen. The prayer wall is open for those who uh, want to pray uh, or be prayed for. Let me tell you, God has been doing a lot of really cool stuff. And we're grateful to the Lord. Uh, don't uh, remember this. When you pray for somebody's healing, do not pray based on maybe your personal experience. Pray based on the Bible. And the scripture says, if any are sick amongst you, call on the elders of the church that they would anoint with oil and pray, and the sick person will be made well. We've seen a lot of miracles, and we're just grateful to the Lord that he's helping us. And we, you know what? Honestly, yeah, we still have people struggling with some stuff, but you know what? We don't know the timing. We don't know the why. But I tell you this, like when I was in the ER recently, personally, the only thing I know is if I'm in a hospital, if I'm at a doctor's office, I'm on assignment. I'm not there for me. I'm there to be a witness to them. So have them kick you out because you're too happy. That's a good thing. Anyways, God bless you guys. Love you guys. Thanks for being here.
supposed to be where I should have been. I feel so much better right now and I feel like I can serve so much better. In my father's hands, my 
in my father's house is a place for me it's I'm a child of God it's I
Lord, we want to thank you for your intimacy with us. God, we want to glorify you and magnify you because of who you are. God, we want to say thank you. We want to say thank you because if we don't sing, the rocks will cry out and we don't want to be outdone by creation. Though we are part, but we were designed to worship you. And I agree, I think the rest of creation is. But, but God, may our worship never be drowned out by the rocks. Because all our lives, you have been faithful. God, I thank you that in my life, I can remember your presence as a small child. We didn't go to church in those days, but I, I remember your call when I was four. I can still see it today as clear as I did the day you gave me the vision. You didn't ask me if I wanted to. You just said, this is what you're going to do. God, I'm grateful. Even on the hard days that hurt, even on the days of attack, even on the the harassment and the garbage that goes on sometimes. I'd rather serve you and go through your stuff than live my own life on my own terms. Every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God. I will see of the goodness of God. I will see of the goodness of God. I just want to see how many times you play that. I'm just kidding. Is God good? He is so